Hello and welcome to a chapter a day where a chapter a day keeps a, keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play. Also, this a chapter a day is sponsored by Seeds of Harvest Library located at 4121 Cleveland Street, Gary, Indiana, inside Market City. They're open from Friday and Sunday, 10:30 a.m. through 4 o'clock p.m. Saturday 10 30 a.m. through 4 30 p.m. They do accept book donations hardcover books only please and you can also follow them on social media. I am your hostess Miss Petters <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed la last time we read and I hope you dwelt on what we talked about last time I know I certainly have um going back reviewing uh so Montag's boss Captain Beatty came over and talked to him about how their version of the firemen got started and sus I think I personally think that he, that Captain Beatty may know that Montag has a book up his sleeve or a book hidden, but pretty much Captain Beatty was telling Montag that books were no longer relevant and they kept people arguing and in order for everyone to be equal they had to burn all books stop which they think stops all arguments and discussion which is wrong because we need that in our world if we don't think about things and think from other people's perspective that's not really equality is it so Apparently, the houses were made fireproof, thus there was no need for firemen anymore, but now the job has changed from being the old way of saving people from burning houses to what Beatty calls the happiness spreaders or the janitors. But is it really happiness? They claim to be the specialist of happiness. Burning books is happy. Not thinking is happy. And just spending hours at a time on entertainment. On entertainment and shortening books. Well, they're not books anymore. They'll be columns or scripts or strips. <laughs> But um, I thought about that last night and I was thinking, wow, this is exactly what's going on in our world today. I just got done reading an article a few days ago about how the average attention span has dwindled from minutes to seconds now. Like you can't. They, they used to be the average attention span for people was a minute. Now we're down to seconds. And it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And it reminded me of uh, what we read yesterday about when Captain Beatty was saying that everything was shortened now and like everything was right away. And I'm looking at 2021 and we can't even stay focused for a minute anymore. It's down to seconds now. So it's like with my videos that I post or, or anyone's videos, if you don't catch somebody's attention for a second, you've lost people and that's terrible. It really is terrible. It's, it lets me know that our society can't wait anymore. That you have to constantly have something in your face. And what does that say to the generation after us? Like, I'm a millennial. I'm considered to be a millennial. But 
the generation after me doesn't have patience, doesn't have time. They need constant attention, constant gratification. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep pausing because I think of all of, uh, well, the article, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, blame TikTok, <laughs> of course. Um, they claimed that TikTok, once it, when it came out, it shortened the expense. It shortened people's uh, attention spans even worse. So if there's no music or loud noise or somebody doing something dramatic or stupid, I'm just going to say stupid, You, your video won't get many views. Or you won't get any views like that even matters. Uh, if any young people are watching me tonight... Please get a life <laughs> outside of social media. I'm sorry that sounds bad, but get a life. <laughs> but seriously, you need to have a life outside of social media. And you're like, wait a minute, you're on social media. Yes, I am. But I'm reading because unfortunately, not everybody, not a lot of people read anymore. What are you talking about? We got ebooks. We uh, I read it on ebook. Have you ever actually held a book in your hand? Yeah. I know some of you are like, yeah, well, duh, books are still here. But how much longer are they here? And I already told you my experiences with the libraries. Now the libraries are pretty much empty. They're silently being gone, like taken away. What happens when libraries don't exist anymore. I mean, yes, now we have virtual libraries. And the library I recently went to, there was nobody there. There were books, oh, of course there were a lot of books, but there was nobody there. And all they did was promote eBooks like going home and downloading them off your iPad or your Kindle or whatever. So what happens when libraries go away? I know a lot of people say, that'll never happen. Even when I read this book for the first time when I was in high school, I, I even asked, what if libraries went away? What if books were illegal? What if I couldn't read the word of God anymore? It was illegal. They'll, I get, you know, usually I got the answer of that'll never happen. That'll never happen. But a lot of stuff we're like I was saying, and a few other people have said for years. Now it's happening, and it's scary. It is. But do not fear. Also, I wanted to share with you guys like a few more things that I've learned from last our last time together. I learned that these people are without empathy in the world of Montags. They don't know sympathy. Captain Beatty, definitely not. Mildred, definitely not. They've lost connection with people. Mildred is a uh, is attached to her screens. The screen is her family. And thus, it's called the family. But it's re you know this the play is called the family on the screens. But that's she thinks that's her real family. How many young people today on Facebook? on any social media, any social media. I'm just naming the ones I know. Like, there's a lot more that I don't know. But how many young people think that these, the people on their Facebook profiles or on their pages are their friends? Okay, let me tell you something. I used to have a personal um, Facebook page. Now I only have a work one. I decided to have, I got rid of it last year I got rid of it last year and 
because of all the stuff that was happening back in 2020. And I was like, I told everybody, hey, if you want to get in contact with me, here's my email. Here's my ad. You know, uh, I didn't give them the address now. Um, if you want my number, personal message me because I'm out of here. Do you know how many people followed me, ba- followed back with me? Zero. 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 So that just lets me know they weren't really my friends or they didn't really care. And that's what these young people need to know that not all these people are your friends. Some of these people just want to see what you're doing and, and, uh, snoop on your life, but they're not your friends. Friends actually pick up the phone and call or text message. But I'm seeing all these young people spend so much time on social media. It gets addicting. I can attest to that. Even when you have a job on here and you have to use social media, it can be addicting because you can, you're you so worried. Like, well, is my video boring? Am I not getting enough views? Is I'm not getting enough picture hearts. We're addicted to picture hearts, people. And, and picture thumbs up. We're addicted to that view count. That's why um, I kind of, whenever I go live, I block the view count on, you know, YouTube. And I I just have my OBS live. Because I, I don't want to see how many people view. I already know. I don't get, I get zero views. And I don't care. Like, we need to learn how to not care. And unfortunately, with young people, a lot of young people, if they see that, they get discouraged and they get depressed. And that's why I'm saying to any young people on here, have a life outside of social media. Step away from it. Step away from it. <laughs> if you can, okay? Step away from it. Find something to do. Find a hobby. <laughs> here I am. And I'm on Facebook. Yes, I'm on YouTube. That's calling the kettle black, but hey. But I'm sorry for this long, really long intro. But I did want to share something with you. A scripture came to my mind when we were reading yesterday. And um, that describes the world of Montex. It's from Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed least at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them now I did notice uh, my video thing is spinning so please excuse me for the latency or the the uh, lack of speed so please forgive me but yeah that's pretty much Montag's world in a nutshell these people are so disconnected they're so disconnected to humanity to everybody like to their neighbors they don't even know who their neighbors are they're connected they're disconnected from their spouses and they they really don't pay attention to the world around them they literally cannot see they have they have eyes but they do not see they have ears but like mildred they don't hear they are closed off and into their into their own selves so with that being said let's get to it sorry for the long intro and if you all just did want to hear the intro you are free to flash forward after this becomes a video and once again i do apologize for the long lag so um 
sometimes technology does that. So here we go. Montag turned and looked at his wife, who sat in the middle of the parlor talking to an announcer, who in turn was talking to her. Miss Montag, he was saying, this, that, and the other. Miss Montag. Something else and still another. The converter attachment, which had cost them $100, automatically supplied her name. Whenever the announcer addressed his anonymous audience, leaving a blank where the proper symbols could be filled in, a special spot Wavix scrambler also caused his televised image in the area immediately about his lips to mouth the vowels and the consonants beautifully. He was a friend, no doubt, of it. A good friend. Miss Montag. Now look right here. Her head turned, though she quite obviously was not listening. Montag said, It's only a step from not going to work today, to not working tomorrow, to not working at the firehouse ever again. You are going to work tonight, though, aren't you? said Mildred. I haven't decided right now. I've got an awful feeling I want to smash things and kill things. Go take the beetle. No, thanks. The keys to the beetle are on the night table. I always like to drive fast when I feel that way. You get it up around 95 and you feel wonderful sometimes I drive all night and come back and you don't know you don't know it it's fun out in the country you hit rabbits something you hit dogs go take the beetle no I don't want to this time I want to hold on to this funny thing god it's gotten big on me I don't know what it is I'm so damned unhappy. I'm so mad, and I don't know why. I feel like I'm putting on weight. I feel fat. I feel like I've been saving up a lot of things and don't know what. I might even start reading books. They'd put you in jail, wouldn't they? She looked at him as if he were behind the glass wall. He began to put on his clothes, moving restlessly about the bedroom. Yes, and it might be a good idea before I hurt someone. Did you hear, Beady? Did you listen to him? He knows all the answers. He's right. Happiness is important. Fun is everything. And yet I keep I kept sitting there saying to myself I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Montag said I am Mildred's mouth beamed and proud of it. I'm going to do something said Montag. I don't even know what yet, but I'm going to do something big. I'm tired of listening to this junk, said Mildred, turning from him to the announcer again. Montag touched the volume control in the wall and the announcer was speechless. Millie, he paused, this is your house as well as mine. I feel it's only fair that I tell you something now. I should have told you before, but I wasn't even um, admitting it to myself. I have something I want you to see. Something I've put away and hid during the past year. Now and again, once in a while. I didn't know why, but I did it, and I never told you. 
He took hold of a straight-backed chair and moved it slowly and steadily into the hall near the front door and climbed up on it and stood for a moment like a statue on a pedestal, his wife standing under him waiting. Then he reached up and pulled back the grill of the air conditioning system and reached far back inside to the right and moved still another sliding sheet of metal and took out a book. Without looking at it, he dropped it to the floor. He put his hand back up and took out two books and moved his hand down and dropped the two books to the floor. He kept moving his hand, dropping books, small ones, fairly large ones, yellow, red, green ones. When he was done, he looked down upon some 20 books lying at his wife's feet. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't really think. But now it looks as if we're in this together. Mildred backed away as if she were suddenly confronted by a pack of mice that had come up out of the floor. He could hear her breathing rapidly and her face was paled out and her eyes were fastened wide. She said his name over twice, three times, then moaning. She ran forward, seized a book and ran toward the kitchen incinerator. He caught her shrieking. He held her and she tried to fight away from him, scratching. No, Millie, no. Wait, stop it, will you? You don't know. Stop it. He slapped her face. He grabbed her again and shook her. She said his name and began to cry. Millie, he said. Listen, give me a second, will you? We can't do anything. We can't burn these. I want to look at them, at least look at them once. Then if what the captain says is true, we'll burn them together. Believe me, we'll burn them together. You must help me. He looked down into her face and took hold of her chin and held her firmly. He was looking not only at her, but for himself and what he must do in her face. Whether we like this or not, we're in it. I've never asked for much from you in all these years, but I ask it now. I plead for it. We've got to start somewhere here, figuring out why we're in such a mess. You and the medicine nights and the car and me and my work. We're heading right for the cliff, Millie. God, I don't want to go over. This isn't going to be easy. We haven't anything to go on, but maybe we can piece it out and figure it out and help each other. I need you so much right now. I can't tell you. If you love me at all, you'll put, put up with this 24, 48 hours. That's all I ask. Then it'll be over. I promise. I swear. And if there is something here, just one little thing out of a whole mess of things, maybe we can pass it on to someone else. She wasn't fighting anymore, so he let her go. She sagged away from him and slid down the wall and sat on the floor looking at the books. Her foot touched one and she saw this and pulled her foot away. That woman... The other night, Millie, you weren't there. You didn't see her face. And Clarice, you never talked to her. I talked to her. And men like Beatty are afraid of her. I can't understand it. Why should they be so afraid of someone like her? but I kept putting her alongside the fireman in the house last night, and I suddenly realized I didn't like them at all, and I didn't like myself at all anymore. And I thought maybe it would be best if the firemen themselves were burnt. Guy! The front door voice called softly. Miss Montag, Miss Montag, someone here, someone here, Miss Montag, Miss Montag, 
someone here? Softly. They turn to the stair at the door and the books toppled everywhere, everywhere in heaps. Beady, said Mildred. It can't be him. He's come back, she whispered. The front door voice called again softly. Someone here? We won't answer. Montag lay back against the wall and then slowly sank to a crouching position and began to nudge the books, bewilderedly with his thumb, his forefinger. He was shivering, and he wanted, above all, to shove the books up through the ventilator again. But he knew he could not face Beatty again. He crouched, and then he sat, and the voice of the front door spoke again, more insistently. Montag picked a single small volume off the floor, from off the floor. Where do we begin? He opened the book halfway and peered at it. We begin by beginning, I guess. He'll come in, said Mildred, and burn us and the books. The front door voice faded at last. There was a silence. Montag felt the presence of someone beyond the door, waiting, listening, and then the footsteps going away down the walk and over the lawn. Let's see what this is, said Montag. He spoke the words haltingly and with a terrible self-consciousness. He read a dozen pages here or there and came at last to this. It is computed that 11,000 persons have at several times suffered death rather than submit to break their eggs at the smaller end. Mildred sat across the hall from him. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. The captain was right. Here now, said Montag. We'll start over again at the beginning. End of part one. Part two. The sieve and the sand. They read the long afternoon through while the cold November rain fell from the sky upon the quiet house. They sat in the hall because the parlor was so empty and gray looking without its wall lit with orange and yellow confetti and sky rockets and women in gold mesh dresses and men in black velvet pulling 100 pound rabbits from silver hats. The parlor was dead and Mildred kept peering in at it with a blank expression. As Montag paced the floor and came back and squatted down and read a page as many as ten times aloud. We cannot tell the precise moment when friendship is formed, as in filling a vessel drop by drop, there is at last a drop which makes it run over, so in a series of kindness there is at least one which makes the heart run over. Montag sat listening to the rain. Is that what it was in the girl next door? I've tried so hard to figure. She's dead. Let's talk about someone alive, for goodness sake. Montag did not look back at his wife as he went trembling along the hall to the kitchen where he stood a long time watching the rain hit the windows before he came back down the hall. In the gray light, waiting for the tremble to subside, he opened another book. That favorite subject, myself. He squinted at the wall. That favorite subject, myself. I understand that. I understand that one, said Mildred. But Clarice's favorite subject wasn't herself. It was everyone else, 
and me. She was the first person in a good many years I've all, I've really liked. She was the first person I can remember who looked straight at me as if I counted. He lifted the two books. These men have been dead a long time, but I know their words point one way or another to Clarice. Outside the front door in the rain, a faint scratching. Montek froze. He saw Mildred thrust herself back to the wall and gasp. Someone, the door. Why does the door voice tell us? I shut it off. Under the door sill, a slow probing sniff, an exhalation of electric steam. Mildred laughed. <laughs> it's only a dog, that's what. You want me to shoo him away? Stay where you are. Silence. The cold rain falling and the smell of blue electricity blowing under the locked door. Let's get back to work, said Montag quietly. Mildred kicked at a book. Books aren't people. You read, and I look all around, but there isn't anybody. He stared at the parlor that was dead and gray as the waters of an elect of an ocean that might teem with life if they switched on the electronic sun. Now, said Mildred, my family is people. They tell me things. I laugh. They laugh. And the colors. Yes, I know. And besides, if Captain Beatty knew about those books, she thought about it. Her face grew amazed and then horrified. He might come and burn the house and the family. That's awful. Think of our investment. Why should I read? What for? What for? Why, said Montag. I saw the damnest snake in the world the other night. It was dead, but it was alive. It could see, but it couldn't see. You want to see that snake? It's at emergency hospital where they fil filed a report on all the junk the snake got out of you. Would you like to go and check their file? Maybe you look under Guy Montag or maybe under fear or war. Would you like to go to that house that burnt last night and rake ashes for the bones of the woman who set fire to her own house? What about Clarice McLean? Where do we look for her? The morgue? Listen. The bombers crossed the sky and crossed the sky over the house, gasping, murmuring, whistling like an immense, invisible fan circling in emptiness. Jesus God, said Montag. Every hour so many damn things in the sky. How in the hell did those bombers get up there every single second of our lives why doesn't someone want to talk about it we've started and won two atomic wars since 2022 that's this year y'all <laughs> is it because we're having so much fun at home we've forgotten the world is it because we're so rich and the rest of the world's so poor and we just don't care if they are i've heard rumors the world is starving but we're well fed is it true the world works hard and we play is that why we're hated so much i've heard the rumors about hate too once in a long while over the years do you know why i Doubt, I don't, that's sure. Maybe the books can get us half out of the cave. They just might stop us from making the same damn insane mistakes. I don't hear those idiot, uh, I don't want to say this word, y'all, like <laughs> B-E-S-T-A-R-Ds, in your parlor talking about it. God, Millie, don't you see? An hour, a day, two hours with these books, and maybe. The telephone rang. Mildred snatched the phone. Ah, 
Anne, she laughed. Yes, the white clown's on tonight. Montag walked to the kitchen and threw the books down. Montag, he said, you're really stupid. Where do we go from here? Do we turn the books in? Forget it. He opened the book to read over Mildred's laughter. Poor Millie, he thought. Poor Montag. It's mud to you, too. But where do you get help? Where do you find a teacher this late? Hold on. He shut his eyes. Yes, of course. Again, he found himself thinking of the green park a year ago. The thought had been with him many times recently, but now he remembered how it was that day in the city park when he had seen that old man in the black suit hide something quickly in his coat. The old man leapt up as if to run, and Montag said, Wait! I haven't done anything, cried the old man, trembling. No one said you did. They had sat in the green soft light without saying a word for a moment, and then Montag talked about the weather, and the old man responded with a pale voice. It was a strange, quiet meeting. The old man admitted a be to being tired English professor who had been thrown out upon the world 40 years ago when the last liberal arts college shut for lack of students and patronage his name was Faber and when he finally lost his fear of Montag he talked in a cadence voice looking at the sky and the trees and the green park and when an hour had passed he has, he said something to Montag and Montag sensed it was a rhythmless poem. Then the old man grew even more courageous and said, and something else that was a poem to Faber, held his hand over his left coat pocket and spoke those words gently and Montag knew if he reached out he might pull a book of poetry from the man's coat but he did not reach out his hand stayed on his knees numbed and useless I don't talk things sir said Faber I talk the meaning of things I sit here and know I'm alive that was all there was to it really an hour of monologue, a poem, a comment, then without either acknowledging the fact that Montag was a fireman, Faber was a certain trembling, wrote his address on a slip of paper. For your file, he said, in case you decide to be angry with me. I'm not angry, Montag said, surprised. Mildred shrieked with laughter in the hall. Montag went to his bedroom closet and flipped through his file wallet to the heading Future Investigations. Faber's name was there. He hadn't turned it in and he hadn't erased it. He dialed the call on a secondary phone. The phone on the far end of the line called Faber's name a dozen times before the professor answered in a faint voice. Montag identified himself and was met with a lengthy silence. Yes, Mr. Montag. Professor Faber, I have a rather odd question to ask. How many copies of the Bible are left in this country? I don't know what you're talking about. I want to know if there are any copies left at all. This is some sort of trap. I can't talk to just anyone on the phone. How many copies of Shakespeare and Plato? None. You know as well as I do. None. Faber hung up. Hold on a second, kiddos. We'll pause it.
I just noticed my camera. Give me one second. My camera is acting up. So, sorry, kiddos. So, we will be using my laptop one because my webcam acted funny. I do apologize. Alrighty. Let me try to. I'm sorry, you guys. Webcam went out on me. I gotta investigate. Let's continue. To God be the glory. <laughs> it keeps going out. Yeah. To God be the glory. Mm -mm -mm. We rebuke this. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, it keeps going in and out. Mm -mm -mm. That went off. Yep, it went out. So I'm going to continue reading. Unfortunately, you guys will be seeing the title page while I keep reading. And I'm going to continue reading. How many copies of Shakespeare and Plato? None. You know as well as I do. None. Faber hung up. Montag put down the phone. None. A thing he knew, of course, from the firehouse listings. But somehow he had wanted to hear it from Faber himself. In the hall, Mildred's face was suff suffused with excitement. Well, the ladies are coming over. Montag showed her a book. This is the Old and New Testament. And don't start that again. It might be the last copy in this part of the world. You've got to hand it back tonight, don't you? Captain Beatty knows you got it, doesn't he? I don't think he knows which book I stole, but how do I choose a substitute? Do I turn in Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Thoreau, which is least valuable? If I pick a substitute and Beatty does know which book I stole, he'll guess we've an entire library here. Mildred's mouth twitched. See what you're doing? You'll ruin us. Who's more important, me or that Bible? She was beginning to shriek now, sitting there like a wax doll melting in its own heat. He could hear Beatty's voice. Sit down, Montag. Watch. Delicately like the petals of a flower like the first page like the second page each becomes a black butterfly beautiful eh light the third page from the second and so on chain smoking 
chapter by chapter all the silly things the words mean all the false promises all the second-hand notions and time-worn philosophies there sat beady perspiring gently beady perspiring gently the floor littered with swarms of black moths that had died in a single storm Mildred stopped screaming as quickly as she started. Montag was not listening. There were, there's only one thing to do, he said. Sometimes before tonight, when I give the book to Beatty, I've got to have a duplicate made. You'll be here for the white clown tonight, and the lady's coming over. cried Mildred. Montag stopped at the door with his back turned. Millie? A silence. What? Millie? Does the white clown love you? No answer. Millie? Does? He licked his lip. Does your family love you? Love you very much? Love you with all their heart and soul, Millie? He felt her blinking slowly at the back of his neck. Why do you ask a silly question like that? He felt he wanted to cry, but nothing would happen to his eyes or his mouth. If you see that dog outside... <laughs> said Mildred. Give him a kick for me. He hesitated, listening at the door. He opened it and stepped out. The rain had stopped and the sun was setting in the clear sky. The street and the lawn and the porch were empty. He left his breath go in a great sigh. He slammed the door. He was on the subway. I'm numb, he thought. When did the numbness really begin in my face, in my body? The night I kicked the pill bottle in the dark, like kicking a buried mine? The numbness will go away, he thought. It'll take time, but I'll do it, or Faber will do it for me. Someone, somewhere will give me back the old face and the old hands, the way they were. Even the smile, he thought, the old burnt-in smile that's gone. I'm lost without it. The subway fled past him. Cream tile, jet black, cream tile, jet black. Numerals and darkness, more darkness, and the total adding itself. Once as a child, he had sat upon a yellow dune by the sea in the middle of the blue, and hot summer day trying to fill a seat a sieve with sand because some cruel cousin had said fill this sieve and you'll get a dime and the faster he poured the faster it sifted through with a hot whispering his hands were tired the sand was boiling the sieve was empty seated there in the midst of july without a sound he felt the tears move down his cheeks now as the vacuum underground rushed him through the dead cellars of town jolting him he remembered the terif the ter the terrible logic of that sieve and he looked down and saw that he was carrying the bible open while there while excuse me there were people in the suction train but he held the book in his hand and the silly thought came to him, if you read fast and read all, maybe some of the sand will stay in the sieve. But he read the words, fell through, and he thought in a few hours there will be Beatty, and here will, he, will be me handing this over, so no, far, no phrase must escape me. Each line must be memorized. I will myself do it. He clenched the book in his fists. Trumpets blared. Denim's dentrifice. 
Shut up, thought Montag. Consider the lilies of the field. Denims, dentrifice. They toil not. Denims, consider the lilies of the field. Shut up, shut up. Dentrifice. He tore the book open and flicked the pages and felt of them as if he were blind. He picked at the shape of the individual letters, not blinking. Denims spelled D E and they toil not neither do they a fierce whisper of hot sand through empty sieve denims does it consider the lilies the lilies the lilies denims dental detergent shut up shut up shut up it was a plea a cry so terrible that montag found himself on his feet the shocked inhabitants of the loud car staring moving back from his ma from this man with the insane gorged face the gibbering dry mouth the flapping book in his fist the people who had been sitting a moment before taping Ta excuse me, tapping their feet to the rhythm of Denim's dentrifice, Denim's dandy dental detergent, Denim's dentrifice, dentrifice, dentrifice. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. The people whose mouths had been faintly twitching the words dentrifice, dentrifice, dentrifice. The train radio vomited upon Montag, and in retaliation, a great tone load of music made of tin, copper, silver, chromium, and brass. The people were pounded into submission. They did not run. There was no place to run. The great air train fell down its shaft in the earth. Lilies of the field, denims, lilies, I said. The people stared. Call the guard. The man's off. No view. The train hissed to its stop. No view, a cry. Denims, a whispered. Montag mouth barely moved. Lilies. The train door whistled open. Montag stood. The door gasped, started shut. Only then did he leap past the other passenger, screaming in his mind, plunge through the slicing door only in time he ran on the white tiles up through the tunnels ignoring the escalators because he wanted to feel his feet move arms swing lungs clench unclench feel his throat go raw with an air a voice drifted after him denims 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 the train hissed like a snake the train vanished in its hole who is it? Montag out here. Montag out here. What do you want? Let me in. I haven't done anything. I'm alone, damn it. You swear it? I swear. The front door opened slowly. Faber peered out, looking very old in the light and very fragile and very much afraid. The old man looked as if he had not been out of the house in years. He and the white plaster walls inside were much the same. There was white in the flesh of his mouth, and his cheeks and his hair was white, and his eyes had faded, with white in the vague blueness there. Then his eyes touched on the book under Montag's arm, and he did not look so old any more, and not quite as fragile. Slowly, his fear went. I'm sorry. One has to be careful. He looked at the book under Montag's arm and could not stop. So it's true. Montag stepped inside, the door shut. Sit down, Faber backed up, as if he feared the book might vanish if he took his eyes from it. Behind him, the door to a bedroom stood upon, and in that room, a litter of machinery. And steel tools were strewn upon a desktop. Montag had only a glimpse before Faber seeing Montag's attention diverted.
turned quickly and shut the bedroom door and stood holding the knob with a trembling hand his gaze returned unsteadily to montag who was now seated with the book in his lap the book where did you i stole it faber for the first time raised his eyes and looked directly into montag's face you're brave no said montag my wife's dying a friend of mine's already died a friend of mine's already dead someone who may have been a friend was burnt less than 24 hours ago you're the only one i knew might help me to see to see faber's hands itched on his knees may i sorry montag gave him the book it's been a long time i'm not a religious man but it's been a long time faber turned the pages stopping he here and there to read it's as good as i remember lord how they've changed it in our parlors these days christ is one of the family now a family program i often wonder if god recognizes his own son the way we've dressed him up or is it dressed him down he's a regular peppermint stick now all sugar crystal and saccharine when he isn't making veiled references to certain commercial products that every worshiper absolutely needs faber sniffed the book do you know that books smell like nutmeg or some spice from a foreign land i loved to smell them when i was a boy lord there were a lot of lovely books once before we let them go and we're gonna stop right here for today i am so sorry that the camera is not has you know went out on me i've been having problems with it i think i might have to get return this one like i dreadfully sorry but let me see if i can get it back mm -mm -mm. i'm gonna try to get it back But, uh, try to get it back. Try to get it back, everybody. Sorry, you see a black screen right now. gonna try to get this camera working again don't you worry but while I'm trying to get the camera back isn't that something that like one of the books that he had was the Holy Bible. It's amazing. And. Okay, so. I've been having problems with this camera. I'll have to fix it later, y'all. But I'm sorry you're seeing a black screen right now. But. I want you all before we close to think why the Bible would be the most important in Montag's world. It and uh, is it still as important today? I mean, the Bible is the most popular, well-selled book 
in our life <laughs> for a long, long time it is the number one bestseller. But it is also number, I think, number 65, according to uh, the band book list of 2019. It is number 65 of the band book list. So I would like for you to think about why would the Bible be banned and why is it the number best number one bestseller? And does the Bible have still have relevance today? As a Christian, I say yes. <laughs> but I want to know what you think. Because mm-hmm. the Bible truly is very powerful. It's words. Like we heard Faber, he said he wasn't a religious man, but yet it was so dear to him reading getting to see the words again and reading the words again imagine if well already our bible the holy bible is already banned in schools in the uk not here but in the uk how long will it be until it reaches america That's why for Christians, it's very important to know our word because who knows, who knows when we'll probably be like the way we're going. It seems like we're in Montag's, we're headed towards Montag's present. So until next time, this is Miss Petals with a chapter a day. But remember, a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play. And we'll see you tomorrow. And I hope, hopefully we'll get this camera fixed. So until next time, 